Hello and welcome to the Evening News for Wednesday, April 16, 2014. I'm Avanash Ramzan. Thanks for joining us. In the headlines, GRA employee remanded for attempting to smuggle cocaine in mail bound for New York. Over 15,000 students began sitting the National Grade 6 assessment today. Government appeals Chief Justice's ruling on Tom Clark's appointment, decomposed the body of S. Equibo man found in Baghdad, and National Broadcast Authority mulls illegal action against illegal Linden radio station. Now for the news in detail. Clive David of Lot 2 Princess Street Lodge appeared in the Georgetown Magistrate's Court before Magistrate Anne McLennan charged with the offense of trafficking in narcotics. It is alleged that between April 9 and 11, David, who is an employee of the Ghana Revenue Authority Customs Department attached to the Ghana Post Office Cooperation, Rob Street, attempted to post a total of 647 grams of cannabis in five sealed envelopes, all destined for the John F. Kennedy International Airport. David, who is 28 years old, was represented by attorney at law Lancelot Patrick Ferreira. The prosecutor, Denaro Jones, asked that the defendant be denied bail on the grounds that he has offered the court no special reasons and has signed a confession that he attempted to post the envelopes with the knowledge that they contained the drugs. Also, the person whom David alleged gave him the drugs to post, when contacted by investigators, denied having done so. Prosecutor Jones also stated that the Ghana police force is on a zero-tolerance campaign on corruption and David, having been an employee of the GRA for the past nine years, should have known better. However, the defense counsel said that the person was never contacted pending investigation. The details state that Yankee, who is the individual whom David alleged gave him the drugs to post, promised him an amount of $1,000 to carry out the act. David is to make his next court appearance in the Georgetown Magistrate's Court before Magistrate Priya Sinarain Bihari on May 19, 2014. The Ghana Women Miners Association, along with the non-governmental organizations, they championed the cause for greater provisions to be made for women in Guyana who are being abused or trafficked. Swatana Marshall reports. Outside the Parliament buildings on Wednesday, members of the Ghana Women Miners Organization, One Billion Rising, Red Thread, and Women Across Differences peacefully protested, calling on the National Assembly to advance the interests of women, particularly those who are victims of abuse and human trafficking. They believe that more can be done for women. GWMO President Simona Broomstall reported that the 2014 national budget fell short of addressing key issues affecting women. She said next week another human trafficking report will be issued and the government of Ghana has done nothing since the last report was issued. Trafficking in persons victims are left to fend for themselves, Brooms told reporters. And he sent to me that the person who trafficked him offered him a ticket and a little bit of cash and he was ready to take it and leave. I don't know of any um, survivor that we have apart from promises that the ministry has really supported where trafficking is concerned. Brooms expressed profound disappointment that the Human Services Minister Jennifer Webster told the House that human trafficking was not a major issue. It's a shame, she said, that young women have to refer to prostitution because no proper system has been instituted to cater for their needs. This is a message that the minister is saying to the Guyanese people. Trafficking in person is not a problem. So policemen, don't fight up. This is not a problem. Court, don't fight up. This is not a problem. Traffickers, continue to traffic. This protest marks the beginning of a series of protests by the joint groups. The National Grade 6 assessment commenced today and will continue tomorrow at the majority of the primary schools and centers across the country. Gomati Gangadin reports. It was reported that approximately 15,500 candidates were registered to write this exam. The Evening News visited several of the examination centers and spoke to some of the students who expressed their thoughts on the examinations thus far. Excited and nervous at the same time. Do you think you did well? Um, yes, well, the test was very easy. And how did you overcome your nervousness? Um, well, I just prayed and breathed, t took deep breaths and it went away. You yep. So you think you did really well in the exam? Well, yeah, yeah, I think so. And what school are you expecting? I'm expecting Queen's College. You want to go to Queen's College? Yes. And you think you worked for that? Um, yes, I've been studying very hard for the past year, last year and this year, and um, I want to know if all, the, if all the hard work will pay off. So you were expected to get to Queen's College? Um, yes. 
It was good. <laughs> well, English. English, it was kind of easy and difficult, but I made it through. Uh, what, was, what about uh, science? Science was pretty cool because that's my favorite subject. It is. Yeah. So what do you, uh, what school do you think you were in? Queens. You definitely think you were in Yes. Queens. You're expecting Queens. Like yes. And you think you put in the hard work for that? Yes. How long have you been studying? Uh, over like three months now. Three months? And were you nervous? Kind of, but my, mo my mommy helped me through and she told me it's not, I don't need to be nervous about it. Okay, and English language and science papers 1 and 2 were written today with mathematics and social studies paper 1 and 2 scheduled to be written tomorrow. The Ministry of Education continues to advise students and parents that all cellular phones and other electronic devices will not be allowed in the examination room. It is therefore asking all candidates to leave such devices at home as any candidate found with such devices during the examination will be disqualified. Reporting for the Evening News, Gomiti Gangadin. Legal action will be taken against 104.3 Power FM radio station operating in Linden, Region 10. Chairperson of the Ghana National Broadcasting Authority, the GNBA, Bibi Shadik, has said. In an interview with this newscast, Shadik said the radio station is operating illegally, explaining that it has not been issued broadcasting licenses for 2013 and 2014 over non-payment of fees. An annual fee of $2.5 million is required to be paid by broadcasters before a license is issued. She said that GNBA has never issued a letter stating that the station would be shut down or would be pulled off air as she debunked statements made by uh, Region 10 Chairman Sharma Solomon. In the Starbrook newspaper, Solomon stated that because of the threat issued, programs are not in sync with certain authorities will not be aired. He complained that the Region 10 Regional Democratic Council weekly program was also pulled off air, although the region has been up to date in its payments to the radio station. But proprietor of 104.3 Power FM radio station, Haslin Graham, rubbished the Starbrook News article, contending that the information presented is false. He told the Evening News that much to his disappointment, the region then chairman has misled the region and by extension the entire country into believing that 104.3 Power FM radio station would be shut down in a week's time. The owner maintained that the RDC owes over $300,000 for programs aired via the station, stating that he has come in for criticisms for broadcasting some of the content contained on its weekly programs. In this report now, you'll hear that government has today appealed the ruling of the Chief Justice Ian Chang on the appointment of Tong Clark Carol Suba. Let's find out more in this report. In the appeal, government argued that the Chief Justice erred in his ruling, which stated that the local government minister did not have the legislative power to appoint anyone to the position of Tong Clark. In the appeal, it was also stated that Chang had misdirected himself in the law when he ruled that Section 95 of the Municipal and District Council Act came into operation in the absence of any evidence. To the contrary, the appeal seeks to have the order of the Chief Justice to be vacated and deemed null. Shortly after the ruling by the Chief Justice, city councillors voted to send Sober on leave pending the outcome of a counter-appeal. However, local government minister Norman Whitaker had announced that the decision made by the city council to send her on administrative leave was null and void. The minister said that immediately after the decision of the Chief Justice, he had advised the acting town clerk to report for duty. Thus, the decision made by the council has no substance. Whitaker said that the city mayor, Hamilton Green, is well aware of the particulars of the rule handed down by the Chief Justice since a signed letter was sent to him indicating that the acting Chief Justice in his ruling was careful to point out that there was nothing to prohibit the town clerk from performing duties as the de facto town clerk. Bisha Mohammed, The Evening News. Newly appointed Crime Chief Leslie James says the Ghana Police Force is finalizing the necessary documentation for charges to be instituted against at least six persons for the kidnapping and murder of Fowl's businessman Rajendra Singh. Bisham Mohammed reports. The six men are accused of murdering Fowl's businessman Rajendra Singh after kidnapping him from his home two weeks ago when demands for a $25 million ransom were not met. The man's body was discovered in Le Printier Cemetery on Wednesday last. He was cremated on Sunday last at Good Hope East Coast Demerara with scores of family members demanding justice. But Crime Chief Leslie James, in a telephone conversation, stated that the files were with the Director of Public Prosecutions up to late this afternoon. 
He is anticipating that the suspects will make the first court appearance tomorrow at the Georgia Magistrates Court. The Evening News was told that the Guyana Police Force secured an extension from the High Court to detain the key suspects beyond the constitutional 72 hours period. Following their arrest, the extension period ends tomorrow, which means that the Guyana Police Force would have no legal grounds to keep the suspects in custody, hence charges will have to be instituted. However, initial reports stated that the men would have made their court appearance at the Georgia Magistrates Court today, with some media operatives lining the steps of the institution, but after a five-hour wait, they left with disappointment on their faces. Bisham Mohammed, The Evening News. Coming up on the other side of the break, you'll hear that the post-mortem results are in for the babies that died yesterday at the Mother's Union Daycare. Stay tuned, this is The Evening News. Welcome back. This is the Evening News on TVG. The Combined Opposition, a partnership for National Unity, APNU, and the Alliance for Change, the EFC, today made calls for the establishment of a state development bank to facilitate loans to persons at lower interest rates. More on this report. Alliance for Change leader Kemal Shantutan today said there was need for the establishment of a state development bank in Guyana to offer small business operators loans at competitive interest rates. This, he explained, be of immense benefit to Guyana's economy. We have been talking about a state development bank. Businesses in Guyana do not have easy credit. And it's one thing to create the educational status for students ready to go into the entrepreneurial activities. But when they now go, there is no money for them to capitalize, to buy the equipment, even if a tractor, to cut down some trees, to plant whatever it is that they would like to plant. And a state development bank is so important for this country. Because when you go to the commercial bank, the rates are now 17, 18 percent, mm -hmm. and uh, it is difficult for them. Uh, those are two measures that we feel could have gone a very far way to ensure job creation, the education, and procuring of credit. The Partnership of National Unity's Shadow Finance Minister Carl Greenwich also echoed similar statements noting that the small businesses of Guyana play a major role in the economic well-being of the country and as such should be afforded the opportunity to grow. I would not oppose the um, proposals that, um, that Mr. Ramjitam has just outlined. I think we would be in agreement um, as regards the need for uh, a, a development bank which addresses um, the needs of industry and, and agriculture. This, this certainly is a, is a necessary area. And so I, 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 go, I, would, I would go with that. It was disclosed by Agriculture Minister Dr. Leslie Ramsamy that small businesses in the agriculture sector contributed close to $38 billion in revenue for Guyana in 2013, reporting for the Evening News, Jomo Paul. A post-mortem examination conducted on four-month-old Philip Pratt revealed that he died from a condition known as bronchopneumonia. More on this report. The post-mortem examination was conducted today on the body of four-month-old Philip Pratt at the Georgetown Public Hospital by Dr. Nihal Singh. The child's cause of death was attributed to bronchopneumonia. Bronchopneumonia is the acute inflammation of the walls of the bronchioles. It is a type of pneumonia characterized by multiple fossae of isolated acute consolidation affecting one or more pulmonary lobules. The baby of Lot 631 South Sophia Georgetown was left at the Mother's Union Daycare on Rob Street, where he reportedly died. The mother of the child, Fillion Winter Archer, who is a ward made supervisor attached to the Georgetown Public Hospital Corporation, recounted that she dropped off her son just after seven hours and went to work. However, she received a call from the daycare around 9.57 hours that her son was not breathing. She noted that she immediately 
rushed to the daycare where she observed her son's motionless body. Winter Archer explained that he was not breathing at the time and was frothing at the mouth while bleeding through his nose. The mother admitted that he was indeed experiencing what she thought was the common cold during the week. The symptoms of pneumonia are similar to those of a common cold and if left untreated can result in death. Pneumonia is said to be the fifth leading cause of death in the world as it relates to infections. Reporting for the evening news, Gomiti Gangadin. A woman and her six children are now left homeless after a fire destroyed their one-bedroom home. The incident took place at around 21 hours on Tuesday evening at Lot 3 Phase 2 Good Hope, East Coast Demerara. Yam Kumiram Bisoon, the mother of six and the owner of the home, told his news scans that she was not at home at the time. Her 15-year-old son, the eldest of the six children, was there to take care of the home and the siblings. The fire reportedly stemmed from a candle that was left to burn. They said that she was at a friend when she received the message that her house was on fire. She noted that once she found her children safe, she questioned her 15-year-old son, who is the eldest, as to how the incident occurred. She was told by the child that he lit a candle and left to go to the washroom in the yard. Upon his return, he observed fire in the house. Bissoon stated that even though her house was not one that was big, she had lost hundreds of thousands of dollars as it was well furnished with a gas, gas stove, sofa set and refrigerator, among other household appliances. A few days after Guyana Sugar Cooperation, Gaisuko workers downed tools demanding that the company pay monies awarded to workers in a 2013 tribunal. Labor Minister Dr. Nanda Kishore Gopal says that although he cannot command Gaisuko to pay the wages, he had suggested that it comply with the calls of the workers. More on this report. Minister of Labor Dr. Nanda Kishore Gopal says that the Guyana Sugar Cooperation should heed the calls for the National Association of Agricultural and Commercial and Industrial Employees Union and pay the employees' monies that were awarded to them from the recently concluded tribunal. Gopal said that his ministry has met with both parties and while the ministry cannot command Gaisuke to pay the monies, they had suggested that the sugar company consider meeting the demands of the union. The Labour Minister, however, maintained that his ministry cannot make procurements on the issue between the two bodies but can offer suggestions and that is what they have done. Meanwhile, head of NASI Kenneth Joseph today told this newscast that although another date has been set by the union for the workers to continue industrial action, there are plans to dunk tools again in the near future. Joseph posited that the sugar workers will protest when it will most likely affect the production of the sugar. In the most recent protest actions which took place last week, sugar workers attached to varying estates in Gaisuku head office took to the streets as they complained of unpaid salaries in accordance with the Norman McLean Arbitration Award and Collective Labor Agreement. For the Evening News, I'm Gabriella Patram. Tom Clark Carroll Suba says Mayor Hamilton Green's vehicles will remain without fuel until he apologizes. Find out for what after these messages. This is the Evening News. Welcome back. George Tong Tong Clark, Carol Suba on Tuesday told reporters that unless Mayor Hamilton Green apologizes for calling her a rodent, she will not issue him money to purchase fuel for his vehicle. More on this report. Carol Suba made these comments following a press conference on Tuesday at City Hall. Suba stated that on Saturday, April 12, 2014, the mayor issued a memo to her informing her that he had required fuel for his vehicle. However, he failed to address her by her portfolio or with respect for her authority. She noted that unless he addresses her properly, she will not issue fuel. He sent a letter to me. He addressed it to Miss Carol Suba, care of Tom Clark's office, and he begged Lord Dear Madame, and his request was for gasoline for diesel for his vehicle. But he chose to address me, Carol Suba, care of Tom Clark. However, I sent this document back to him with a note. Only the Tom Clark can authorize the issuance of fuel. And you can all take a shot of it. He wrote in green ink, well, I copied, so it's that. And he said, well, 
since you are deemed the de facto town clerk, why not issue me? Yes. Now, I don't know if this is, is a very senile person we're dealing with, but that's what he said. But I must issue him the gas since I am deemed the de facto town clerk. Well, I sent it back again for him to address me properly. Certainly, I will give him the diesel if he will come over to my office and apologize to me. At a statutory meeting on Monday, which was held at City Hall, the woman alleged that Mayor Hamilton Green also called her a rodent, and as such, a rodent cannot issue fuel. For the evening news, Gomati Gangadin. Presidential advice on governance, Gail Teixeira tops the bracket as the highest paid worker attached to the office of the president. Teixeira is paid a whopping $1 million, while the lowest paying staff, which is a typist, receives a meager $43,000. Here's Swetlana Marshall with the details. Presidential advisor and governance scale to share is the highest paid worker attached to the office of the president in the area of presidential advisory. Junior Finance Minister Bishop Juan Angel made this disclosure on Tuesday during the consideration of monies for the office of the president under the program titled Presidential Advisory, Cabinet and Other Services. In the top 10, the presidential advisor in governance is followed by the head of the presidential secretariat, Dr. Roger Luncheon, who received $983,238 per month. The presidential advisor is paid a handsome sum of $735,553. The Director General of the Civil Defense Commission, Chabilal Ramsru, has a monthly salary of $728,887, while the presidential advisor in sport receives $721,000 per month. The divisional head is paid $648,402. The Senior Deputy Secretary of Cabinet receives $552,333. Coordinated Public Information is paid $551,214. And the Administrator receives $525,000, while the Advisor on Sustainable Development is paid $496,000. The Supreme Court has gained financial independence from the government and will now be budgeted for as a special agency, getting a lump sum allocation in accordance with the Constitution. More in this report. According to Finance Minister Dr. Ashney Singh, this change is in keeping with discussions held last week with the opposition. Last week, APNU Carl Greenwich presented a motion for all the entities tasked with protecting the rights of citizens be granted in lump sums. However, the motion was withdrawn after the Finance Minister undertook to make the Supreme Court a lump sum budget agency. What it achieves is a exactly as was contemplated in the Constitution and a financial allocation approved by this National Assembly after consideration of the Supreme Court's budget as contemplated by the Constitution as part of the determination of the national budget. The Constitution, the language of Article 222 is quite clear, sir, and there's very little that I can do to um, uh, elaborate or elucidate it further. Suffice it to say that the result will be the approval by this National Assembly after due process and consideration of a lump sum allocation for the Supreme Court. Greenwich noted that there is much more to be done regarding the anonymity of the judiciary. There are other dimensions to the independence of the judiciary, which we will, which we will have to continue to strive for, which have to do with knowing the request that was made before and the adherence to the disbursement in a manner that has been approved by this House itself. So, that is one step in what is probably a, a multi-stepped a multi, um, process. The Committee of Supply went on to approve the $1.4 billion for the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Legal Affairs budget of $288 million was cleared. During this Legal Affairs, Minister Anil Nandala was grilled by APNU parliamentarian James Bond, who highlighted that more money is allocated to meals and refreshments rather than to scholarship programs. That question demonstrates my learned friend's unfamiliarity with the way central government is run, in particular in relation to scholarships. Scholarships are done centralized yes. via the Public Service Ministry. And the Ministry of Legal Affairs administers no scholarship program. 
The public prosecution agency is to receive $111,655 million after Minister Nandala justified the money requested for the agency. For the Evening News, I'm Gabriella Patram. More news still ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching the Evening News. This is the Evening News. Welcome back. In the courts, 32-year-old Leon Hope of 126 Thomas Street Kitty appeared before Magistrate Anne McLennan on Tuesday at the Georgetown Magistrate's Court after he was charged with two counts of unlawful assault so as to cause actual bodily harm. The first charge read that on May th March 30, 2014, Hope dealt his mother, Debbie Hope, several cuffs, slaps and kicks, while a second charge read that he did the same to his child mother, Kimberly Hellingsworth, on April 14, 2014. The defendant, who was unrepresented, pleaded not guilty to both charges. State prosecutor Denaro Jones objected to bail, citing the nature of the offense, stating that the Ghana police force has a no-tolerance campaign for domestic violence and the fact that the defendant assaulted his own mother. The virtual complainants also told the court that Hope has a violent nature and often makes threat to their lives. Magistrate McLennan then advised Debbie Hope, the defendant's mother, to get protection order against him. Hope was reminded it will make his next court appearance on May 19, 2014, before Magistrate Priya Sinrain Bihari at the Georgetown Magistrates Court. Last evening, the National Assembly's Committee of Supply saw the funding for several ministries cleared. More in this report. These agencies were presented on the Prime Minister Samuel Hines, who answered queries posed by the combined parliamentary opposition. The allocations for the office of the Prime Minister was approved to the sum of $4.6 billion and was cleared without any question by the combined opposition. Along with the PM's office, Funds were also cleared for the Ghana Defense Force to the tune of $7.9 billion without the opposition making any queries. Meanwhile, the office of the Ombudsman came under brief scrutiny when its $35 million allocation was up for consideration. Could the Honorable Prime Minister 62984 say what $11,500,000 represents? 6284. Investigators, legal fees, and other services. Investigators. Follow up. Legal consultation. Legal consultation, legal fees. Yes, on the website. Investigators. Follow up. How many investigators? As the need arises. No, how many, how, many, how many are catered for under that None, head? None is catered for specifically here. There's a sum of money that's available to pay for investigators as the needs arise. Then some $19.2 million allocated to the Public Service Appellate Tribunal was subsequently cleared, but not before the Prime Minister was questioned about the agency. I'm advised that there has been a search or uh, there has been a search for suitable candidate. I am advised, and I do believe my advice is true, that there are consultations, that there have been consultations or attempts at consultation between His Excellency the President and the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I think the Prime Minister has been Badly advised. Thank you. Follow up. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, could the Honorable Prime Minister indicate what would have been the reasons for all these years that this public service appellate tribunal would not have been constituted? Monies for the Parliament Office were also approved to the amount of $4.4 billion by the Committee of Supply after Prime Minister Hanks answered questions posed regarding the adequacies of money allocated to the Parliament and staff payments. The decomposed body of an unidentified male was discovered at New Road Bagdam on the Essequibo coast. The gruesome discovery was made by a farmer who was gathering manure in the cow pasture at back of New Road Village. 
The farmers, while gathering the manure, saw a huge flock of carrion crow munching on something. Upon investigation, he saw a swollen and decayed body. He then raised an alarm where residents quickly gathered at the scene. The police was then summoned and are presently investigating the gruesome discovery. In case you've just joined us, you're watching the evening news. Stay tuned for sports, sponsored by Macor. After the break. Welcome back to the evening news. Now for a look at sport, but first, the headlines. Kerif the Games athletes wing out tomorrow. Deroop mulls contempt of court proceedings against the PMTC. And Narain spins Kolkata Knight Riders to opening IPL win. Of course, your sportcast comes through the kind compliments of MacWorp. We believe that everything worth building should be built just once. But that is why we build on culture, on trust. On integrity. We exist to do more, better, faster, safer. Your success depends on the foundation it's built on. Everything we do is meant to move you forward. Marco, let's build Guyana together. Welcome back. We start off with some cricket news. Sunil Narain picked up four for 20 to hand the Kolkata Knight Riders a convincing 41-run win over the Mumbai Indians in the opening match of the Pepsi IPL 2014 in Abu Dhabi. Chasing 164 for victory, Mumbai could only muster 122 for seven as Narain spun webs around the batsmen. Ambati Raidu was the only man to get going with 48, while Rohit Sharma made 24. Earlier, Kolkata Knight Riders' innings was built around a second wicket partnership of 131 between Jacques Scalis and Manish Pandey. Scalis top scored with 72 from 46 balls, while Pandey stroke 64 from 53 deliveries as Lasit Malinga picked up 4 for 23. The IPL will continue tomorrow with the Delhi Daredevils playing the Royal Challenges Bangalore in match 2 of the tournament. The Guyanese contingent for the Karifta Games will wing out tomorrow to represent the Golden Arrowhead and President of the Athletics Association of Guyana, Aubrey Hudson, has expressed confidence that the team will do Guyana proud. Tristan Joseph reports. All systems are in place for the team's travel tomorrow morning for the 2014 edition of the Junior Karifta Games. At a press conference held earlier today, President of the Athletics Association of Guyana, Aubrey Hudson, expressed his confidence in the team. This team is leaving with a lot of expectations. And I know um, I got the assurance from them constantly that they're going to go there, do their best. And I think once people like Jason and Kevin and, and, and Kid go there and do their best along with the girls, um, we should have everybody coming back here with some weights around their neck. Coach of the team, Sham Johnny, also believes the team can rise to the challenge and produce results for Guyana. I think everybody is capable in their um, special own event, right? I think everybody would give good account of themselves based on what we've been seeing the build up to this competition. I think everybody's responsible enough and know what we're looking forward for. I think everybody will represent themselves well. While some of the athletes expressed confidence in doing well, jumper Kate Pierce, who will be one of the first field event athletes to participate at the Games for Guyana, was particularly happy about the opportunity being presented. I'm privileged to be in the fourth class, so to speak. Um, mentally, like Coach Cham said, we still need some work. Well, for me, I can speak for myself, because this is my first competition field event out of the country. So mentally, I still need some work, but I'm very confident. Coach has been working with me, even over the phone, even while I was in Bartica, coach has been working with me and I put in the work and I feel confident that I can do my best. The team is set to depart at 6 hours tomorrow morning and is expected to return on April 22, around 14 hours. The Ghana National Rifle Association has named a strong team to participate in the 2014 Commonwealth Games to be held from July 23 to August 3 in Glasgow, Scotland. 
National Captain Mahindra Pasod, a Commonwealth Games veteran and reigning West Indies individual champion Lennox Braffitt, make up the two-man team, while the experienced rifleman and win coach Ronsford Goodluck will serve as coach and manager. In 2010 at the Commonwealth Games in New Delhi, Pasod and Goodluck had teamed up to place fifth in the Pierce competition, the best showing by a Guyanese team at the Games. Pasod said the team will be looking to better its New Delhi showing, but expects tough competition from the 21 other competing nations. Finally, some horse racing news. Following the non-registration of scores even for this Sunday's Ghana Cup fever, owner and trainer of the animal Dennis Deroop is mulling contempt of court proceedings against the Port Moron Turf Club executives. Rajiv Bisnot has been following the issue. The animal was denied entry for the race meet due to the fact that the event does not provide for A-class animals. To this end, the Roop's attorney Adrian Anamayo revealed to this sports cars this morning that the executives at the Port Moron Turf Club are demonstrating clearly that they have no regard for court orders and the laws of Guyana. The attorney said the organizers are clearly forcing a contempt of court proceedings to be filed against them, while noting that their disregard for law and order by itself disqualified them from running the race meet. The group secured a high court injunction on Tuesday from Judge Sandra Kojas in the Burbies High Court, which instructed the executives of the Port Moran Turf Club to register scores even to participate in the Cup. The injunction was filed against Krishnan Pasad Jagdeo and Chatagun Ramnath, who are trading under the name and style of a turf club. Both Ramnath and Jagdeo received the injunction and are now seeking legal advice on the way forward. Meanwhile, Ramnath on Wednesday said that the club will stick to their original program and will not allow scores even to participate in Sunday's race meet. When contacted on Wednesday, former president of the Guyana Horse Racing Authority, Cecil Kennard, and Kennard's successor, Vic Odit, both declined to comment on the issue. The Guyana Cup Fever is the brainchild of Jumbo Jet Auto Sales and is the largest horse racing event. And with that, we have come to the end of sport, which was sponsored by MacCorp. Of course, you can find these and many more stories in tomorrow's edition of the Ghana Times. And here's an invitation to join us on TVG Channel 28 and on Radio Guyana Inc. 89.3 in Esequibo, 89.5 in Georgetown Environs, and 89.7 in Burbies and Unicary, Suriname. Stay tuned. Your bridge reports on the other side. believe that everything worth building should be built just once. And that is why we build on culture, on trust, on integrity. We exist to do more, better, faster, safer. Your success depends on the foundation it's built on. Everything we do is meant to move you forward. Marco, let's build Guyana together. Welcome back now for a look at your bridge reports. The Damrara Harbour Bridge will be closed on Thursday, April 17 at 5 hours for a period of one and a half hours. And the Burby River Bridge will be closed on Thursday, April 17 at 5 hours 20 for a period of one and a half hours. And with that, we have come to the end of the evening news for Wednesday, April 16, 2014. I'm Avanash Ramzan. Thanks for watching.